Welcome back to the Techimaki channel. Today we're going to talk about persistence. We are in a series of videos where we are creating an order taking system. This is the video where we are talking about the backend. And in the backend, we are first creating the menu microservice. And this menu service actually contains information about products. And we want to persist these products somewhere. So in case there is a restart in the service or the service is not available for some time, when it gets back, when it restarts, it can load the data from some sort of database. Okay, so now here comes the question. Are we going to use a SQL database or a NoSQL database? Well, one of the things that usually is said when you think about a NoSQL database as a disadvantage is that NoSQL databases don't support ACID for multi-documents. So actually, let's first talk a little bit of what is a NoSQL database. A NoSQL database is a database that instead of working with tables and columns, it works with documents. So basically, it's a document structure that is persisted in collections. So that's the main difference in very, very, very high level of what is a NoSQL database. But in the in most of the solutions that were created so far, there is no support or lack of a real good support for transactions when it comes to multi-documents, when it involves a document in one collection, a document in another collection, so on and so forth. And this is actually something that usually makes people go and think about, oh, am I really going to need this in the future? And if I need this in the future, I'm going to have a problem, right? So thinking of this, I'm bringing here a solution that is a NoSQL database, but actually can guarantee asset transactions for multi-documents. And actually, since a while ago, this is not a new uh, NoSQL database solution. And this database solution is called RavenDB. RavenDB is a document database that supports asset for multi-documents uh, for a long time. So what is asset? Asset is basically guaranteeing four specific attributes. So let's try to understand what are these four aspects. The first is atomicity. So it's kind of all or nothing, even in multi-document transactions, right? So in the case of uh, relational databases, it's basically guaranteeing that if we make changes that involves three, four, five tables, we are only going to, if we start that with a transaction and finish uh, this execution inside of the same transaction, it means that everything needs to happen. And if anything fails during this process, we roll back the whole thing. So we guarantee that this is atomic, right? This is something that either everything happens or nothing happens. The same thing applies to NoSQL. We need to guarantee that if we change three, four, five, six documents, we need to make sure that everything is going to be persisted or nothing is going to be persisted. The second characteristic is consistency. So consistency is basically only the data that is valid is actually saved. So in case you have, for example, data from a certain transaction that actually went up to the middle, we are not going to save this data. So it's kind of complementary to the atomicity, but it's basically guaranteed that we are not going to have like half transactions persisted in the database. The third one is actually isolation. So one transaction goes in its own flow and it doesn't affect other transactions. So multiple transactions can happen at the same time. And we are going to guarantee that in case there is something happening in this transaction, it's not going to affect the other transaction that may be using the same documents or the same tables. So this is what guarantees the isolation. And the fourth thing is durability, is how in case, for example, we have a power outage in the server, so actually the server crashes or anything happens or the application crashes or database crashes. In this case, we're going to guarantee that either the transaction is fully persisted or if, the, if there was a problem during the persistence of the transaction, the full transaction is not persisted. What it actually guarantees is that there will be nothing partially persisted from what we put inside of the transaction. All right, so how we're going to run the RavenDB in our solution? I'm going to download the RavenDB as the RavenDB Docker image 
But actually, what is Docker? Docker is a solution that allows us to run a application inside of a container. So it's an isolated and virtualized environment that contains all the dependencies that that piece of software needs to run. So the good thing is that you don't need to install all the prerequisites or anything that is necessary. And this application runs in the best environment possible in order with all the environment variables and all the settings and everything that is, it needs to have it the best possible setup. The good thing is that all of this is prepared by a developer that is actually the one that is going to provide the Docker image for you. And then all you need to do is to download that from the Docker Hub and use that in your machine. And the, one, of, one of the other good things that we have is that we can use Linux type of containers in Windows OS. So that's amazing, right? Because we, in this case, I'm going to use a Linux OS and inside of this Linux OS, the RavenDB is, is, is going to be running there. And we are going to do a pull and get that image and run this container in our Windows machine just by using Docker. So what I'm going to do first, I'm going to install Docker. Here is the link to the Docker CE desktop for Windows. So if you have a machine that is running the Windows uh, 10 or, or, or any other version, you can download that by clicking in this link uh, to go to the Docker Hub and Docker CE desktop. And the CE actually is Community Edition. So that's the version that you're going to download. As soon as you download this version, you're going to see an icon here, right? Which is basically the one that tells you that the Docker desktop is running. And by default, it works with Linux containers. So that's very funny, right? Because uh, by default, if you are in a Windows machine, the default containers and, and images that are supported are Linux images. So in case of RavenDB, it's a Linux machine. So that's exactly what we are looking for in terms of solution. Okay. So uh, in order to get more details on how to install Docker, it's just a very simple wizard. It's a MSI that you download if you're thinking about Windows, right? And then uh, in order to follow the instructions, this is the YouTube link that you can follow. These are uh, instructions of, from the official channel of Docker team. So after you install that, you also need to go to the extensions in Visual Studio Code and you need to install the Docker extension. So just type Docker in your extensions marketplace and you're going to see this Docker extension. Then just click in install. In my case, I have already installed, so it's in showing uninstall. But in your case, if you haven't yet installed, it's going to show install. You click on it and then it's going to install everything that it needs to make Visual Studio Code a good place for you to manage your Docker images and start and stop containers. So uh, as soon as you install it, it is going to present this icon over here, this Docker icon. When you click in this Docker icon, you're going to see all the Docker images and you're also going to see all the containers. I have some images and some containers because of all the exercises and works that I've been doing. But basically, uh, if you have just started the Docker, then this list probably is going to be empty. So then that's all you need in order to have the Docker. And then with Docker, we're going to start installing the RavenDB. In order to install RavenDB, we need to run a certain command in our terminal. So let's go to the terminal and do docker pull RavenDB slash RavenDB. And then this is going to pull the RavenDB from the Docker Hub. And this is the path for the Docker to find the name of the image in the Docker Hub. So this is the path that contains the exact image of RavenDB that you are looking to retrieve. This is definitely the latest one because we haven't specified anything. So after the name of your image, you can put a column and basically you can put the tag. And this can be a specific number of this image because uh, there are versions of this image. Or you can just, if you don't put anything, or if you put, for example, column and latest, it's going to get the latest version available of this image from the Docker Hub. All right, so now we have the Docker downloaded. Even though it's downloaded, it's not started yet in my machine. In order to do this, I'm going to use the following command, docker run and minus p 8080, column 8080, ravendb, slash ravendb. And why I'm putting this minus p 8080 
column 8080. It's because by default, the Docker images, when they are started, when they become a container instance, the network inside is in breach mode. This is the default network solution that is used for the Docker containers. And the breach mode actually means that the network inside of the container is completely isolated. So then we need to specify what are the ports from this network that we are going to make available outside of the Docker container. So basically, uh, from the local network, we need to expose the port 8080 from inside of the container to the external world. So it means that RavenDB is going to be running inside of the container, exposing an HTTP service in the 8080 port, and we are going to be forwarding this port to outside of the container. So then it's available on the host. Okay, so that's how that's why and that's the reason we use the minus p so then let's hit enter in this command and this is going to start the container you are going to be able to see in the left side you're going to see on the containers area here that it's starting the container and then it starts successfully it's starting the raven db over here and then it means that if we try to reach out now localhost uh, column 8080 in our browser in the browser of the host Due to the port forwarding, we are able to see the RavenDB instance. So let's do it. Okay, so now I open a browser and I'm going to navigate to the localhost 8080. So localhost 8080 is going to show me the RavenDB initial page. That's the page that has the end user agreement. So then I just need to scroll that and then click in accept. When I click in accept, it is going to open for me all the options of installation of RavenDB. And I'm going to choose at the moment, just because of development purposes, I'm going to choose the un unsecure. So I click on it. By default, the port is going to be 8080. That's okay. The DCP port by default is 38888. And the IP address is the one that I need to choose. I'm going to choose actually the IP of the Docker Container. So if we if we go to IP config and I'm going to go back to the terminal here so you guys can see this. So if I do IP config in my machine, this IP is not going to be show here, right? And uh, what is actually this IP 172.1702? Let me show you what it is, right? So basically, if I think it's going to show, I mean, it's not going to respond because it is actually inside of the container. So if I do Docker inspect and then uh, the name of the RavenDB instance, which in this case is Youthful Car Carson. It's a, they, they get like generic names because uh, if you don't specify a name, it gets a generic name for you, right? So let's just call Youthful Carson. And then let's inspect this Docker instance. Okay, so if we inspect this Docker instance, you're going to see that the IP address of this instance is 172.17.0.2. And this is exactly the IP that we are going to choose for our RavenDB instance. So I'm going to select that and clicking, I click that I understand the risks of running that in an insecured, unsecured mode, right? Then I click in the checkbox and hit next. This is going to finish the configuration and I need to click in restart server. So then the container internally is going to restart and the RavenDB service is going to be available for me in the localhost 8080 in a few moments. Okay. So uh, then I just wait for a few moments. It's going to show like a blank page. Then I'm going to open again localhost 8080. And here I'm going to see the RavenDB studio is started. RavenDB Studio has a very good studio, a very good dashboard. You can see a lot of things here. You can see the CPU usage, memory usage. You can see the traffic. You, you can see the databases, all information. It's very straightforward and it's very simple to use. It also has a notification bar that tells you that you need to have a license. In order to get the license, all you need to do is to go to the RavenDB website and then you can issue a license for you. So basically you put your email and your basic information and then you receive an email with your license. Then all you need to do is to come here and register the RavenDB instance. All right, so I registered my RavenDB. It is very okay to use the community license for like a hobby project or for something that you were not planning to use heavily in a production scenario, okay? 
So great. So now that we have registered the RavenDB and everything is set here, we need to create the databases. But instead of creating this manually, we could come here and of course create the database in case we wanted to do that. But let's do that via code. That, that's the best place for creating the database in case the database does not exist. So in our use case, I'm going to do that in the C-sharp code of our menu microservice. Okay, so let's stop for now, but let's continue on the next video where we are going to create our database context and also allow the menu to actually persist data on the RavenDB. If you haven't yet subscribed, make sure to click on the subscribe button and also click on the notifications in order to receive information when I publish new videos. If you have already done that, help me spread this free content with your friends and colleagues. Okay, so I see you soon on the next video.